Hey, how you doing? My name is Pastor Yaku Shelley. I'm the senior pastor of the Hand of the Lord International. Uh, thank you for tuning in to us. And out of all the things that are happening and manifesting now, we're uh, having to go live. And so uh, we're going to experiment with this live piece for the first time uh, with our Bible study piece uh, uh, this Wednesday. Um, I want to continue with what we've already been talking about for uh, a couple months, if not a month and a half. We've been dealing with first fruits. And on Wednesdays, we do a series called First Fruits One on One. Um, the fact that we don't have a live audience, we're not able to, you know, answer questions and uh, have Q&A. But feel free uh, to put your comments or questions down uh, in the comment section and someone will be available to address them for you. Uh, as we've been talking about first fruits, even on Sundays, uh, we've talked about how first fruits are connected to our giving. Uh, we look at our increase that when God is taking you to another level, doing something in your life, you got to understand that every time you hit a new level, that is known as first fruits. We've talked about that, uh, how in our giving to God, first fruits, we've talked about uh, our attitude in our new beginning is our first fruits. And I want to kind of introduce another aspect uh, of first fruits as it relates to relationship. Um, that the difference, one of the major difference that you see with tithing and first fruits is that first fruits can also be connected to people. Um, I want to start with 1 Corinthians uh, 15, uh, starting at verse 20. And I'm coming from the King James Version, and the Word of God says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that sleep slept. For since by man come death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. And so I read verses 22 through 23. Also, I want to include uh, James, if you would. If you're following along with me, I'm also including James 1 and 18. And the word of God says, of his own will beget he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of all his creations. You look at also uh, in Romans 16 and 5 and 1 Corinthians 16 and 15, uh, it connects the first believers that was at Antarctica that um, when they became believers that they opened up that region. So we look at that first fruits is also connected to relationship. It's connected to people. One of the things that I want to um, put in your heart today, and I believe that God has you listening, is, is to understand that where you are in your life, God is offering you as a first fruit offering. You are the first fruits. Anytime God wants to do a thing. He has to start with someone. And many of you right now are feeling the pressure of being that first fruits offering. Notice that when we first started and we read out of first Corinthians that Christ was our first fruit. God wanted all believers, but he began with what? His only begotten son. He not only began with him, but he offered him up. He offered him so that he can have other sons and daughters. He wanted us to have eternal life. So he had to first offer up his only begotten so that you and I who come after him can also partake in that first fruit offering. Many of you right now, what you're facing in life, you are, you're that first fruit. You are feeling the pressure of that first fruit. The problem is, and what I'm sensing in my heart, is that many of you don't understand that you are that first fruit offering. And, and how do I know that? Because you're complaining about being the black sheep of the family. You're complaining about the fact that someone else is being favored over you. You're complaining about uh, things that's not going right in your life. And the sad part is that you have reduced God to only be a good God. In other words, the moment that he stops being what you deem to be good, then you question his very existence. Here, here lies the problem. Could it be that in your bloodline, could it be on your street, could it be in your neighborhood, could it be on your job, could it be that God is using you to be the first fruits? In other words, he's taking your life because you said it belongs to him, and now because you have given 
to him your life. He has the right to govern and or dispose of your creation as he chooses. So therefore, he has the right to mold you, make you into the image of his son, however that needs to take place. The problem is that when God begins to mold us or what the, the Bible says conform, conform means to put something in the middle and begin to shape around a thing that's been set in the middle. So if we're to be conformed to the image of his son, that means he's going to now place his son, who was the first fruit offering, inside of you. And now he's going to shape you to look more like him because now people don't know that he exists. So now he uses you and I, our life, the things that we go through, and he begins to shape us to look like his son. While we're, we're having onlookers or spectators, they are watching this transformation take place. And as this transformation is taking place, we can't take credit for it because it's something that's happening outside of our own will. It's something that's stronger than us. It's something that's greater than us. It's something that's bigger than us. And so now it, we're finding ourselves being conformed. And, and after we get through out of a trial, a tribulation, a season of testing, we come out looking different. We come out speaking different. We come out thinking different. It is because God is allowing you to be the first fruit offering. We talked on this past Sunday about David using David as his first fruit, that when he first came into the palace and, and he was coming out the field, one verse tell us that Saul said that he was to come into the palace and he could no longer go down to his father's house. In other words, David shifted from being a shepherd in, in the field to now operating inside of the palace. Here's the scary part. David had never been in the palace before. David didn't know the custom of the palace. He didn't know the language of the palace, but he was now in the palace. Uh, and, and we talked about that many times we can start speaking too fast about a new um, uh, realm in our life because we're so comfortable with the old realm and that new realm makes us uncomfortable. And so now the danger of what I see inside of people is that when God is shifting them to a new place, they, they, they tend to want to bring the, the, the parts of the old place that they enjoy to the new place. The problem is that once you move from the field to the palace, you're, you got to be willing to adapt to the custom of the palace. And just because you don't understand the ways of the palace doesn't make the palace wrong. Imagine if David uh, uh, turned around and, and made a comment and said, well, why are they using gold plates and gold cups? What, what's, they, they're wasting that stuff. But the truth of the matter is not that they're wasting it. And, and if we had gold cups and plates in the field down at Jesse House, it would be considered a waste. But, but, but now that David's in the palace, he got to be careful what he says because what he say could go back to Saul. It could kill the next level. And many of you right now, and I believe that the Bible says that death and life is in the power of the tongue. Many of you are destroying your new level because it's unfamiliar territory. Anytime you're at a new level, there, there's a couple things that should take place. Number one, there should be a part of you that that and that's able to track what God has already taken you through. In other words, you should be able to see some type of preparation for the next level. And what I mean by that, I believe that God always prepares you before he places you. So you should be able to track the hand of God over your life. And, and even though you're in a new arena, you may not know how to navigate all together. You should be able to track and see, you know what, God has been preparing me for this for a while. I just didn't know that he, it was going to look like this. Secondly, we got to um, begin to open our heart to, to the perspective that now as I'm moving into a new arena and I don't quite understand that new arena, it doesn't mean that that arena is wrong. There's a certain uh, governing. There's, there's new rules. There, there are new applications. There's a new language. And so if I take my field mentality, bring it up to the palace, and act exactly like I did in the field, it could probably disqualify me from the palace. So you got to understand that when you hit the, the next level, and then many of you are there right now, and I'm here to catch you because you're speaking things out of turn. You're saying things against where you are because it has you in a place of uh, being uncomfortable. And, and you should feel uncomfortable. But this next level of uh, 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 being uncomfortable is, is meant to now cause you to rely on God even more. It is meant to cause you to be quiet when you feel like you need to talk. See, and you can be in the field and everybody's asking you your opinion, but the moment you move to the palace, you, you're now you're the last on the totem pole. And, and people are not asking you to give them your wisdom. And now that's your moment to learn. That's your moment to, to think within yourself. I would do it like this, only to find out that it should not be done that way. But the, but the problem is... you. 
is that you haven't hurt anyone. So, so the benefit is that you can think all you want to, but the moment you open your mouth, you show what you know and what you don't know. And many of you are in a new arena, and this is your time to si simply learn the culture. Ask questions. Find out the things that you don't know. The, the, instead of saying it's not right, just be open to the fact that maybe you don't know all that you think you should. And instead of, instead of telling someone what they need to do different that looks like your, your previous experience, maybe you just need to open up and say, well, why do you do it that way? Not why as in change it to the, what I'm more familiar with, but why so I can get a better understanding. And so that's where many of you are right now. And the problem is that you're speaking out of turn. You're getting frustrated. And so now the moment you're inconvenienced, you're, you're telling the world how inconvenienced you are. You're posting things about uh, things are not right. And, and now Corona is here and, and my job is acting like this. My finances is acting like this. But, but if we track your, your, your page and we scroll down, not too long ago, you was talking about how wonderful God is and all the things that he could do. See, see what you're actually doing is showing God that I'm too immature to handle where you're seeking to take me. And so that henceforth the problem. And if God wants to use you and use myself to be a first fruit offering to your family, say he hasn't done something in your bloodline, but he wants you to be the first one. Please understand it's not going to be easy. Please understand you're going to go through things. Please understand you can fast, you can pray, you can read the word of God, you can do all those different things and life is still going to hit you. You're still going to find yourself being tried. You're still going to find yourself going through some type of suffering. Listen, God is not punishing you. He's developing you. Now, you, you can't ask God to increase your life. And, and I want you to get this. You cannot ask God to increase your life without also being prepared to be the first fruit. When you study first fruit, it's always connected to some type of increase. Now, if you've been asking God to increase your life, understand this. You're also saying, without understanding, Lord, also make me the first fruit offering. Now, Pastor Shelley, what does the first fruit offering look like? Well, look in the mirror. Look at your bank account. Look at who's talking about you. Look at who don't like you right now. All of those things are indication that you have been chosen to be the first fruit offering. So just uh, if we do the law, the uh, law of uh, first uh, mention, and in those who studied hermeneutics understand that when you give a principle, it's important that you, you go back and find out where's that principle first seen. So if, if, if God wants to use you to be the first fruit offering in your bloodline, let's, let's use the first family as an example. And, and that first family is seen in, in Genesis chapter 4. Uh, we have Adam, Eve, and we have two sons. We have Cain and Abel. And if you look at Genesis uh, chapter 4, you will find out that, that God is, is, is about to do something in the lives of, of Cain and Abel. Okay, and, and as he get ready to, to bless them, increase, he increases both of them. But Abel is willing to, to, to provide God a first fruit, whereby Cain simply gave. Okay, and so what happens is that Cain begins to get an attitude with what he sees God is doing in Abel. God addresses Cain's issue. He says, why are you, why are your countenance down? Why are you looking that way? What's, what's the deal? What's going on with you? It's not as if God didn't know, but what he was doing is giving Cain the opportunity to flush out this, this, this level, this next level that was making Cain uncomfortable. See, we see that Abel could have very well also been uncomfortable, but the difference with Abel, Abel kept relying on what God said over what he saw, whereas Cain just simply did what was convenient. And so you got to be careful in this season that when God makes you the first fruit, you, you never rely on, never chase what makes you comfortable. If you, if you have two, two options that you have to do, one is going to make you super uncomfortable. The other is not going to make you uncomfortable at all, but you're in the season where God is making you the first fruit. I, I, I want to I wanna strongly suggest it might be, it just might be the thing that makes you super uncomfortable may be the thing that you need to do. Well, Pastor Shelley, why would I do that if I'm uncomfortable? Well, I, 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 that doesn't sound right. It, it doesn't sound right unless you understand that it has everything to do with increasing that new level. And so what has to happen is, now I'm not definitely asking you not to do anything contrary to the word of God, but what I'm trying to teach you is that when you get to certain levels in your life, you cannot rely on what your emotions, on, on being comfortable. you got to be willing to go outside. If God is ever going to stretch you, if he's ever going to grow you, you must be willing not to be comfortable. 
And so many of you are at that place right now that you have to make a decision. But the problem is you want you want the great benefits without uh, the great sacrifice. And so you got to understand if God was willing to give his only begotten so that he have other sons and daughters and make Christ the first fruit offering, name something that you're going to have to be willing to part from that God's going to say, oh, you know what, since that means so much to you, you don't have to do it. That's not, that's not the case. So if he gave his only begotten the, the thing most dear to his heart, you must be willing to give the things mo most dear to your heart. Now, with that being said, I want to tie you in with this. Anytime God is going to increase your life, be prepared to suffer loss. I want to say that again. Anytime God is about to increase your life, be prepared to suffer loss. The immature thing is to believe that God is going to keep increasing you without you suffering any kind of setback, without you suffering any kind of loss. You're going to have to suffer some losses on your way to increase. He did it with his son. He gave his only begotten that he may have other sons and daughters. He suffered loss to get increase. Whoever told you that you won't have to go through anything lied to you. I'm just going to be honest. Whoever prophesied to you, I don't care how much oil they use, I don't care what tone they did it in, they told you God's going to increase your life. Without the expectation of suffering loss, they lied to you. The truth of the matter is you got to be prepared to lose in order to gain. God's math is amazing. Uh, when we ask him to multiply us, increase our territory, he can start that same process. The night that you pray that, he can start that same process. But here's the thing that you may have not taken into account. The moment you ask him to increase you, he, you're now going to suffer loss. So, so he's on a way to increase you, giving you the very same thing that you asked, which is right in the middle of his will for your life. But guess how it might come? It might come you getting to work the next day and they tell you they don't need you anymore. It might come you getting to work the next day and they tell you we have to shut down for a few weeks and we'll, we'll give you a call back. It might come like that. It, it might come with, with you getting sick. It, it might come with you uh, having to lose your home. It may come with you having to lose your car. Now, Shelly, well, why in the world would God do such a thing that if I ask him for increase, I start losing stuff? Um, have you ever known that the fact that we're finite beings, which means that we are limited? In other words, we can only handle so much at some, at, at, at all at once. So what God does and how he began to show me, he's, he's, he's now allows us to lose. The moment we lose, we're actually uh, stretching ourselves to be able to receive again. And so now he allows you to suffer loss. And then during the period of su suffering loss, he, he's actually stretching your ability to receive more. But if he was to give you more without that loss being in your life first, you would probably think it was you that got you to where you are. It will probably cause you to be high-minded and exalting yourself, prideful. It may cause you to look down on people because you didn't lose anything. You just got. And so when somebody comes to your life and say, how did you get to where you are? You may say stuff like, oh, you know, I got this job because I went to school and I stayed up all night and I had an a awesome GPA. Or, or you may say something crazy like, I, when I got to the interview, I, I killed the interview. They had no other choice but to hire me. But if you suffer loss first, if you suffer loss first, you recognize that you may say, I prepared myself for the interview. But it was only by the grace of God I got the job. If you suffer loss first, you, you say stuff like, uh, I, I thank God for my marriage because I had some bad relationships prior to. I, I, I'm able to appreciate my husband because I, I was with a man who who. He didn't provide for us. It was me that was a provider. I, I, I had to do it all by myself. Matter of fact, I, I felt like I married a, a child. I had to raise children, but I felt like I had to raise him too. But now that I have a man in my life, I know the difference. You had to first suffer loss. You can appreciate your wife because the, the other women that you had, they, they, they was only there to get something from you. But you, you can appreciate her being a helpmeet because she recognizes her responsibility is to aid you to reach your full potential as it is yours. And so the, the, the woman you had in your life before, she, she, she didn't cook for you simply because she didn't want to. She did not see it as a team that if I, whatever I could do to, to make your job a little easier, I'm willing to do. No, her mindset was, it's all about me. And so if you ask for anything, they took you to the, through the third degree as if you inconvenienced them 
because you married someone that was selfish. So my point is this. The truth of the matter is sometimes after we suffer loss, we're able to be more appreciative. We're able to be more thankful. We're able to acknowledge who really it came from. Because when you suffer loss before the increase comes, God shows you how frail you are. And I know some of you, you know, you, you anointed, you called by God, and um, you've already dispatched your angels this morning. Uh, my problem is you really think you are the reason this stuff is happening. You really think it's you. Well, maybe you need to suffer loss. It amazes me when people are talking about entrepreneurship. They say, all you got to do is grind. Uh, that's not my testimony. I know what it's like to grind and still don't make anything. I know what it's like to dress the part and try to close the deal and you still don't get it. I know, I, I know what it's like for somebody to say, you know, you did great, we're going to call you and I never get the call. That's just me. Uh, and because of those things, anytime God increases me, I'm often reminded by how it got there that it was him. Because if it was me, it would have happened 10 years ago. So if it's happening now, it got to be more than the fact that I just got my grind in. To me, it has to be more than I spoke positively this morning. I, I, I spoke those things into existence. I've done all that and still didn't receive it. But when my increase came, just me, it was through the grace of God. Abel trust God in his increase. Cain did not. He simply did enough to get by. God begins to favor Abel, and Cain had an issue, so much so that it led him to murder his own brother. I don't know who it is that I'm speaking to, but I want to help you understand if God has made you the first fruit offering for what he desired to do in your life and increase you, you got to understand that part of that increase is going to cause somebody else to be jealous of what God is doing to you. Now, here's the funny part. They had the same opportunity you had, but they did not choose what you chose. They did not let go of what needed to be let go. They did not sacrifice when it was time to sacrifice. They did what was convenient. But the moment they start seeing God elevate you, because whether you believe it or not, there's people in your life who, who's actually gauging where you are compared to where they are. And, and if they feel they are doing better than you, they really they, they think that they're somewhere where they're not because their measuring stick is you. See, the problem becomes that when somebody's watching you and you could not be studying them, the moment that you start elevating beyond them, they can start to hate you. See, some of you are not ready for increase because uh, we randomly throw out haters, uh, but I believe you don't really get haters until you begin to walk in the will of God. And so God is requiring somebody that's listening to me right now to do this very thing. He's requiring you to trust him and sacrifice when other people are doing what's convenient. In other words, what tends to take place is that at the moment of testing, you rely on the word of God where they rely on their feelings. They rely on what their friends said. They're not relying on the Bible. They're relying on themselves. And so because you're having to let go of your pride to obey the word of God, you're doing that, and God's going to get ready to do more in your life, and they, they want to do what's convenient. There's going to be a season where now your obedience is going to begin to kick in, and, and now your increase is going to begin to come. And it's going to come at a faster rate than theirs. you got to be also mindful of the fact that when that begins to happen, everybody that you tell about your increase won't be happy for you. Some of you already know what it's like to have relationships and go through all this crazy stuff with people. Then you finally meet someone, and, and you find out that they are the very thing you've been asking God for and even more. And now you tell your friend, you know, I'm engaged. And they say, girl, that's all right. The truth of the matter, they're not happy for you. They may even agree to being in your wedding. They may even stand up right by you. They may even hold your bouquet. But the truth of the matter, they have an issue. See, the issue is you didn't know that they're actually comparing themselves with you. The issue is they're reminded when you said that you're going to wait before y'all entertain certain things in your relationship. But they kept doing what they was doing. Now the fruit of your labor is being seen, whereas they are not where they used to be. Matter of fact, they have digressed. And they could be standing right in the midst of your wedding party and hate you. The truth of the matter, they're hating what God is doing to you. Don't apologize for God increasing you. 
Matter of fact, it, this takes me into this, that when you look at uh, Adam and Eve, notice they had two sons. One son gets murdered. The other son is on the run. They lose, his two, they lose two sons out, out for one incident. Many times people don't want to receive this part, but if God gets ready to increase your life, you got to be prepared for some people to leave. Some people will walk away. Some people will tell you they don't want to deal with you anymore. Some people will tell you not enough. Some people will leave and won't even have the courtesy to, uh, to tell you why. But it's okay. What aches my heart right now is that many of you can't see that, that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be, to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. And you have some people that's in your life is doing this thing, what, what I've uh, I learned is called self-select, self-select. Self-select is when someone selects for themselves to remove themselves from your life. They may come and, and tell you, well, you know what, I think this over. And, and you are perplexed because they just gave you something for your birthday. And they tell you, well, I'm moving on. Um, and you're just trying to figure out why. But the truth of the matter is they have self-select. They have made the decision to remove themselves from your life. I want to fast track and save you some time. Let them go. Tell them okay. Thank you for the time we had. Thank you for the memories. Thank you. And the reason I'm telling you that is because if you spend most of your energy trying to recoup what doesn't exist anymore, you're wasting your time. If they are choosing to move on, it's a reason. Whether you agree with the reason or not, it's a reason. Let's look at it in this capacity. Maybe I'm suffering loss because God's about to increase me. Maybe this friend needed to leave in order for me to appreciate a new friend. Maybe I lost this because I'm about to get that. That's how first fruit works. Now, Adam and Eve didn't know that God was going to send a promise seed called Seth that was going to come after losing both sons. And just imagine, I mean, they are human. You have two sons, and one incident caused you to lose both. One is running because he committed murder. The other is murder. Imagine what Eve felt like when self came. He was a, I, I'm just guessing he was a, a, a breath of fresh air. Now she was able to do with him that she didn't do with the first two boys. Sometimes God gives you a reset. That reset sometimes comes in the form of grandkids. You know, at one stage of your life, you're doing the best you can with your children. You recognize 20 years later, you could have did something different. You don't get to rewind them. It comes in the form of grandkids. And so your children can't understand why you're more patient with the grandkids. It's because you learn. It's because you're in a new season. And so many of you are not going into a new season. You are into a new season. And, and, and I know that you are in a new season. Why? Because you're suffering some stuff. You're suffering loss. Some people are walking out your life. They are self-selecting. Self-selecting also brings us to what I call isolate. Isolate is I recognize this is not working. This is not fruitful. I got to get out of this. And so you select for them that they need to go. Both can hurt. Both can tear at your heart. But both may at some point be necessary. And see, the thing that I'm trying to help some of you to realize is God is making you the first fruit offering. You're forfeiting that grace because you're trying to make everybody comfortable around you. He may be dealing with you on doing something else with your money than just parting all the time. But everybody you know is still parting all the time. And so now you're going to have to self-select. You're going to have to isolate. I'm sorry. You're going to have to say, I'm not going without giving an explanation, without lying as to why. God is doing something in my life, and, and where he's taking me, spending all of my money on clubbing is, is not going to get it. You may have someone who, who may want to smoke. You may have someone who want to drink. And, and at one point, that was fine. But now you're at another season, and you recognize that that thing is not a part of where you're going. You're moving from the field to the palace, and your mindset is shifting. Running around to get how many women you can sleep with at one season of your life made a whole bunch of sense. Now you're maturing. Now you, you're looking at women not just for being sex objects, but you're looking at them for being potential wives. You're shifting. God is growing you. You're the first fruit offering. 
if you handle yourself right during this season, you're going to be amazed at what God doing to you. If you're struggling, if you're suffering loss, if you're going through something that's out of your control, may I offer to you that you might be the first fruit offering. If you have no income coming in right now because there's a virus that everyone is scared of, but you, you're not the maker of that virus, but you're suffering from the virus, you could be the first fruit offering. You may be someone that your church is closed. Um, you can't gather more than 10 people because of what the, the ordinances of the county, but you would just believe in God to expand your ministry. You are first fruit offering. I want to say to you, instead of asking God to give you more members, make your crowd larger. How about asking him to make you more influential? Maybe this is helping you to see it's not what you thought ministry was. Maybe it's not in your crowds. Maybe it's not in the size of your building. Maybe God's trying to help you to see where I'm taking you. You need to be more minded on being influential than being famous. All of these things point to the fact that you could be the first fruit offering. But Pastor Shelley, if I'm going through all of this and it seems like if this thing don't turn around real quick, I'm going to lose everything I have. Well, how did you get it in the first place? If it was God that gave, he can give back again. If it was you, then you might be in trouble. But the Bible says a man's life does not consist in the things in which he possesses. It's good to have them, but that's not what defines you. Don't let anyone tell you that. It's not what you drive and what you wear and where you live that defines who you are. It's are you in God's will for your life? Are you doing what you was created to do? And if that is the case, then in heaven you're being rewarded. I believe that there's some people watching right now. God has you right in the vein of being a first fruit offering. With that, he's going to increase you. But you have to suffer loss first. You have to be able to handle people talking about you. And when they don't have anything to say, they lie. It's okay. Be the first fruit offering. He's not going to allow you to defend yourself. Let them think what they think. Let them feel however they feel. Be the first fruit offering. You are the most important piece to this puzzle. How you respond, your attitude, will dictate your attitude. Will you kill the next level with your mouth because death and life is in the power of the tongue? Will you take back and lessen your pride to learn a new arena, to learn a new language, to learn a new culture? It's up to you. But I want to encourage you today as I end in prayer that you will open your life to be the first fruit offering God wants you to be. Father, I thank you for those that are watching. Whatever season in their life that they are in, you have allowed them to tune in to tell them that they are the first fruit offering. And there's nothing in their life that they can't afford to lose that you can't restore or restore better. If you gave your only begotten son that he was the first fruit for those who slept, sleep, you wanted to give us eternal life but you had to first offer him your most important prize. How much so you will with us. So, Father, I ask for not that you stop whatever's happening. Mm -mm. I pray that you will strengthen them right now in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the losses. I pray that you will give somebody divine wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I pray that you will open someone's heart, that they, they, they will read more. They will fast more. They will pray more. I pray that in the midst of this season that they will cry out to you like they've never cried out before. But instead of it being something to relieve the pressure, you're using it to build relationship. So, Father, I thank you for whatever you need to do to draw the hearts of man back to you. I ask that you do it. However we need to be squeezed, however we need to be uncomfortable, you just have your way. That we trust you to be our comforter. And so, Father, we just come in agreement now for what you have allowed us to share just these few moments. We pray that someone's heart will be pondered. Someone will repent. Someone will ask you for another chance. Someone will not destroy this season simply because they didn't understand what was going on. And, Father, I ask that those who rely on your word over themselves, that you will not withhold any good thing from them, 
that in their time of increase, may you let their cup run over. Have your way in their life, spiritual, relationally, and financially. In Jesus' name.